Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this Grattan conversation. I'm Danielle Wood, CEO of the Grattan Institute. I'm joining this webinar today from uh, beautiful but cloudy Boonaroon country, and I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and all the lands that people are joining um, this webinar from, from around the country today. So this afternoon, we're going to be talking about an issue that really goes to the very heart of the functioning of our democratic system. It's one that sits below the surface from time to time, bubbles up onto the front pages of our newspapers and TV news bulletins, often to disappear as quickly as it emerge. But it matters. It matters for who gets elected and holds positions of power. It matters for the decisions they make when they're in power. And it matters for the trust that voters have in the system. Um, it's corruption. <laughs> it's not just bags of money changing hands and explicit uh, quid pro quo, although uh, we have literally seen that at times, but also grey corruption, misuse of office for either private or political gain, which is far more pervasive and difficult to stamp out. I'm delighted today uh, that we are joined by two very qualified Australians that have spent time thinking deeply about these issues and what we can do about them. Uh, first, we have Fiona McLeod. Fiona is a senior counsel and has led peak national legal bodies, including the Law Council of Australia. She's chair of the Accountability Roundtable, a body committed to improving integrity in public office, and is a former chair of Transparency International Australia. Uh, Fiona is the author of a fantastic addition to the Monash University Press in the National Interest series. Uh, if you are interested in this issue, I really recommend Easy Lies and Influence as a companion piece for today's discussion. Uh, and we'll pop a link to that in the chat now. Uh, welcome, Fiona. Thank you so much for, for rushing from the courtroom to be here. And um, congratulations on a very compelling book. Thank you very much, Danielle. Um, and we also have joining us today Dr Lindy Edwards. Um, John Hewson was originally supposed to be on the panel, but unfortunately he is unwell. Um, we wish him a very speedy recovery. And we are so grateful to Lindy for stepping in to, to share her expertise at the last moment. Um, Lindy's a fantastic thinker on politics and institutional issues. She's previously worked as an economic advisor in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, a press gallery journalist for the Sydney Morning Herald, and has been a senior policy advisor to an Australian political party leader. Uh, she is now a senior lecturer in politics at UNSW. She's a regular media commentator on issues and is currently working on political donations, lobbying and corporate power in the political decision-making process. Um, Lindy is also the author of an excellent book uh, released last year, Corporate Power in Australia. Um, Lindy, Fiona and I are going to chat for the next 25 minutes or so. I'm going to aim to leave a good 25 minutes for audience Q&A. So if you have questions, please pop them in the Q&A tab. Uh, we have a big audience today, so I know there's going to be lots of questions. So my advice is get in early. I probably won't get past the top of the pile. So if you want your question answered, whip it in as quickly as you can. Um, so let's kick off with you, Fiona. Uh, as I said, a fantastic book. Um, why did you think it was important to write this one? Um, so I too would like to acknowledge uh, traditional, traditional owners. Um, I'm here on Wurundjeri land and um, that's part of the Kulin Nation here in Victoria, of course. Well, um, the inspiration for this came from my work through the Accountability Roundtable and Transparency International and attending a lot of um, global conferences, meetings here about corruption on the global sphere. And certainly I had a, an image of corruption overseas and, and the, the uh, critical way that that can um, subvert democracies and um, fledgling democracies overseas. So there was this um, impression of how bad it was overseas and I, I guess I was lulled into a sense that our democracy was pretty strong here in Australia. We didn't have this sort of corruption apart from the odd thing that came up in a Royal Commission, a bit of anti-money laundering and the press talked about with Crown Casino and so on. So I was quite stunned to begin to learn about the extent of corruption here in Australia. The other thing, of course, is that we call it these very soft names. We call it pork barrelling, we call it rorting, we call it duchessing, we call it favouritism. And without the grit of a name like corruption, it's really easy to misunderstand how pervasive it is, how persistent it is, what it costs us in terms of our failure to react, the cost to our economy, the failure of opportunities. 
and the money we can't, uh, the money we just don't have to spend on decent programs. And it costs us in terms of our trust in government. Now, I should disclose that I was a candidate in the 2019 election, the federal election for Labor. And it was at that time I realised people are paralysed by these issues. They either don't change their votes, there was sort of a collective shrug about it, or um, they think there's nothing they can do about it. So it was at that time I thought, with a bit of encouragement from uh, Monash and those um, who were writing this series, that I thought, okay, well, let's get some of it documented because there are lists everywhere of the rorts, of course, and occasionally they pop up in parliamentary committee hearings. But I thought, let's let's get something on paper, describe what it is, describe what the impact is, and talk about what we can do about it. Fantastic. And if I... Um if I can just indulge in a little bit of reading from your book, sure. if I might, Fiona. I mean, I, I think the way you you just describe it is is very compelling, um, and I'd like to share it with the audience. In Australia, corruption spends public funds in pursuit of power, rewards favour, and strips support from meritorious programs. It silences journalists and those charged with upholding standards of integrity and depriving them of funding. Corruption acknowledges loyalty through appointments to office and the preferencing of those with favoured networks ahead of others of greater or equal talent. It conceals itself through unfit for purpose access to information laws and processes, vague budget commitments, the assertion of unchecked executive discretion, a quick media cycle and overburdened parliamentary committees. Uh, and it goes on from there. I and mean, I think that's a, a really kind of powerful pulling together of the, the web there. Um, obviously, though, kind of calling it corruption, um, do you think you raise the risk of of pointing to those things of being as serious as, as what we more traditionally think of corruption as the kind of bags of money under the table? Well, in a sense, this is bags of money under the table. The, the sort of um, spending that we're seeing and favouritism that we're seeing is bags of money under the table. Let's take the Leppington Triangle purchase for an example. Originally assessed as having a value of $60,000, by the time the government announcement was made, that land was valued at $30 million. And by the time the department went ahead with a purchase, $300 million was paid for that land. And um, th there have been committees of inquiry that have looked into this, but there's no doubt that a windfall gain to those landowners, land originally valued at $60,000 of $300 million, which then, of course, inevitably finds its way back into political donations and purchase of influence in that circle of influence. That is corruption. And what does it mean to those of us who are missing out on funding for our NDIS or our aged care systems and all the other things we know are failing? It means that we lose trust. And this is really a critical time for us to be trusting what government needs to do to look after our interests. The pandemic is a very good example of that. Climate change and the emergency around our inaction around that is another example where trust is so critical. But every time you take a step like this, every time there's a mate appointed to a government committee that tells you to invest in his own sector or his own industry, uh, then, of course, we have that trust further whittled away. And people, I think, understand that it's just that we don't understand what to do about it or how to fix it indeed and we'll obviously come back to what to do about it and how to fix it in this session um lindy i wanted to come to to you on your corporate power book and ask you the same question um what what was your motivation for writing that one and, and what did you learn through the process of writing it so the spark for it really was me wondering is it as bad as it looks the, the impetus came, do you remember the financial scandal uh, in the wake of the GFC and the reining in of the banks around um, the, the financial advice scandals and recall the debates about whether or not uh, financial advisors should be required to act in their clients' best interests. And it just looked shocking. And Labor had sort of made a lot of noise about having been really impacted by corporate power in their time in office. And I was like... Given the nature of the media landscape, it's actually really hard to work out how much truth there is to these claims at the moment. And so I decided to investigate myself. And I have to admit, I went in there with a sort of, you know, the former public servant's optimism that what was going on behind the scenes was hopefully 
you know, that there was hopefully good work going on behind the scenes despite things looking pretty grim um, so in what was happening in the spotlight. But what, so what I did in this book was I went, so I looked at governments' clashes with our 10 largest or most powerful corporations over a 10-year period, and I looked at what the corporation's policy preferences were at the beginning of the policy development process and compared it to what went, what made it into law at the end to see how often the big corporates were getting what they wanted. Um, and what I found was that each of these big corporates operated in sectors that were dominated by sort of one to four really big players that towered over these value chains. And their fights with government were always over laws that have impacted where the profits were realised in the value chain. And what I found was that in three of the five sectors I looked at, the largest corporates could consistently get laws that allowed them to scrape the wealth out of the value chain into their own hands. Um, and the, yeah, and I have to admit I was quite, it was really worldview changing doing this research. I was quite shocked, but even when at, at the extent to which uh, the largest yeah. corporations were being able to dictate these outcomes. I think the book really does kind of, um, it sort of hits you in the face seeing all the examples that are brought together in the one place, just in, in the same way Fiona's does around corruption more broadly. Um, Fiona, I wanted to come back to a point that you made earlier about your time as the Labor candidate in Higgins and the, the, the resigned shrugs that you would get when you, you raise these accountability issues. And I think you also mentioned in the book the kind of, oh, you're all the same um, kind of reaction as well. Um, why do you think it is? Why do you think that, that people aren't more engaged or incensed about these issues? And, and does it mean we're essentially getting the conduct we deserve if we don't engage with these? Um, well, they do say you get the politicians you deserve. And so Perhaps that's a reflection on me not be, having been a successful candidate. But um, I think there's at least a couple of things operating here. The first is that increasingly we're seeing uh, people get away with it. And so when billions of dollars of public funds are squandered on um, unworthy projects, if I can call them that, or overpayments are made and uh, we see procurement protocols and other processes subverted to, for um, an urgent, apparently urgent, but rather a political process, um, such as the submarines purchase or sports rorts sprinkling around public money like um, confetti. Nothing happens. There's no one held to account. And remember in sports rorts that the minister responsible was actually ultimately sacked or asked to resign over a fairly trivial issue of a conflict of interest because she held a membership of one of the clubs that got, um, or it was probably an, an honorary membership of that, in one of the clubs that she, um, she had, um, gave a grant to. The deeper issue about the breaches of ministerial standards there and the unlawful nature of that activity, described as unlawful by eminent professors, including Antumi and, and Cheryl Saunders, was never addressed. And she was appointed back to a position where she had no loss of income because she was appointed leader of the Nationals in the upper house. No one, no one is held to account for these things. It's like the mode of operation at Parliament House is to stare these things down and hope that we'll forget because of a quick media cycle or because we're all so stressed about being locked down constantly and what it means for our futures. So no one's been held to account. And that Politicians are depending on that and our short attention span, hoping that we will not ultimately hold them to account because we can be reminded, you know, of other things in the in the heat of a campaign. And the second thing I want to mention about as to why I think we're getting uh, they're getting away with it is because we have become desensitised and dishonesty itself is normalised. So we are somehow paralysed by the institution, by the inability of those institutions and of government to self-regulate. We're overwhelmed by the sheer weight of reports of corruption, the inadequate responses of under-resourced uh, parliamentary committees, journalists who are chasing a story and not staying on an issue like this, and the, the constant undermining and under-resourcing of the anti-corruption oversight committees themselves. Remember, after the Auditor General pointed out the sports rorts um, issues, his, his budget was then cut. And 
This is another deliberate attack on those integrity mechanisms that unless you are focused on this thing pretty much full time, all these attacks are continuing to mount and our framework for integrity in this country is being severely undermined. I want to come to a question that's come through a couple of times in the, the the Q&A from both Chris Abbott and Cecile Menard that sort of follows on from that, Fiona. Um, they're saying what can ordinary citizens do um, if, if they are engaged in these issues? How, how do they hold politicians accountable around these types of issues? Uh, okay, so there's a we do have a framework of integrity measures that are mm -hmm. in place. They're, they've been eroded, but um, they are in place, and there are some new ones we need. The heavy artillery is clearly the National Integrity Commission whatever you call it. And the model that the government has put forward at the moment is a model that the former Attorney General, Christian Porter, has made pretty clear is intended to protect MPs and their staff. So it's a very weak model and it cannot be a model that will function effectively to do the job it needs to do. And I'll just say about that Anti-Corruption Commission, when he was a senior prosecutor in Western Australia, um, Christian Porter then supported the WA Crime and, and um, Corruption Commission, he was said publicly he was a staunch supporter of it. And yet when he was asked to design and bring in his own Commonwealth Integrity Commission, he designed it deliberately in these two parts to weaken the part that can focus on members of parliament. So if the government is going to commit to that weak model, it will produce something that effectively is whitewashing corruption when you see it amongst uh, members of parliament and um, their staff. So you've got to ask the question, what influenced him to change his mind over the years to then stop being a staunch supporter of that model and become somebody who preferred a weak model in terms of integrity measures? But there's a bunch of other stuff that we need to be doing. We need to create codes of conduct for members of parliament. And there's been talk uh, recently about the failure of ethical standards of members of parliament and their staff and how they're not covered by those codes of conduct. We need the Prime Minister, ultimately, it's a matter for him and the Prime Minister of the day as to whether they uphold ministerial standards or not, but they've got to count for something. And those protocols around making spending announcements during a, um, uh, the caretaker period after the election's been called, they've got to count for something too. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff we need to do around whistleblowers, uh, to make sure the markets are, um, uh, there's integrity in the markets. And as Lindy writes so beautifully about the corruption in the corporate sphere, there's a lot that can be done there too. And um, we really need to address that issue of campaign fundraising because the minute a person stands for office, any office at any level of government in Australia, the risk of corruption is real. They need to raise funds, raise funds to fund their campaigns, and they are dependent from the day one that their candidacy is announced on having that funding to be able to buy the pamphlets and paraphernalia and core flutes and all the rest of it that they need. The minute a government is elected, it has some public funding based on how much money they get from the Australian Electoral Commission based on the number of votes they get, but that funding is nowhere near enough to run the sort of campaigns that we see in Australia. So public funding for those things would address some of those risks of corruption. So what I'm really saying is we need a broad framework that looks at all these things and tackles where the weaknesses are. And we need a genuine commitment from government to be more open about its spending and the decisions that it's taking in those processes. Fantastic. Very comprehensive answer. Um, Lindy, I will come to you on that question as well because I know you've spent uh, a lot of time thinking about this accountability framework. Um, what, what do you think are the kind of weaknesses in the current system and, and what could we do about them? Well, I think, I think it's worth pointing out a few things. One is I think it's really worth pointing out that this problem has got dramatically worse recently. Um, and I think that those of us who haven't been watching politics, you know, for those of us who've been watching politics very closely for a long time, it's shocking and quite, you know, very, very concerning um, to see the, the behaviour that's becoming normalised so rapidly. And I think that there is this problem that for lots of people, 
are, as Fiona says, getting quite desensitised by it or they think it's always been like that or they think both sides are the same, that some of those kind of it's always like this, there's nothing we can do. We need to actually be really clear something dramatic and important is going on at the moment where this is getting radically worse um, and that we we need to name that and call that out. Um, in terms of the lack of censure, I think one of the things that's really challenging about the context that we're looking at at the moment is that there's a whole bunch of things that are a part of how the political ecosystem works that are a challenge to this environment. And I think one of the things that's difficult is that in the past we used to have a press gallery um, of a coterie of journalists who were watching politics very carefully, who knew the rules, and when politicians broke the rules, they alerted everybody who was ignoring politics and getting on with their lives. They splashed it across the front pages. What was on the front pages of the quality press was then the basis of what happens on radio and TV. And so having this small group of experts watching carefully and calling out bad behaviour meant that it carried costs and consequences and politicians used to lose their, you know, used to lose their jobs when they did this stuff. And one of the things that's changed is, I mean, I think there were there are pros and cons in the way that that press gallery coterie were gatekeepers on the system and on the information that flow out of it. But one of the things that's happened is the change in the media environment means that politicians are increasingly being able to just ignore the quality press and to go around it, and that's not how people are getting their information. Um, and... The other thing is also that the press gallery isn't operating on that unified voice of protecting the rules anymore, that it's become more tribal um, and, you know, I mean, I think we had, you know, it's become more tribal and so that really important function of who it was that's watching, which alerted people, which ensured there were consequences, that that environment's changed. Um, and I think really significantly it's been uh, the role of the Murdoch press, the way in which they've changed their understanding of their of their role and approach to how they report politics is really important. Um, and so, you know, I think in addition to, you know, I think Fiona's absolutely right around some of these sort of legal and institutional things, but I think there's also these bigger system-wide issues. And we actually, one of the things we've really got to be doing to do something about this, you know, the impact that the Murdoch press is having and their perception of their role in the political process, um, you know, is a really important factor on this. Lots and lots of Australians don't even know this stuff is happening because it's not reported in the media they're receiving. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very important point. Um, so that, that might partly go to the question of why politics of change is hard, but I just want to unpack that for, for a moment. I mean. When you actually poll on some of these things, you know, donations, reforms, lobbying reforms, they seem to poll really well. Um, so you can sort of see 80% plus support for these types of changes, which suggests the public, um, you know, does care on, on some level and would like to see change. Um, given that it's so popular, um, why don't we see the major parties um, take these types of policies to elections? Uh, and I'll, I'll start with you, Fiona. Um, well, I'm aware that the Labor Party has backed a strong National Integrity Com Commission model and has introduced um, a new idea recently around ministerials uh, being required to report to the Minister for Finance and then public tabling of any decisions that made that go contrary to a department's advice. Now, my suggestion as a lawyer would be that you don't permit them to do that in the first place. And currently the Prime Minister has... Um, according to um, various sources, compiled about a $4 billion war chest to spend on um, purchasing votes, basically, at the next election, which is something we should be very concerned about. We've seen this creep of undisclosed or unallocated spending in budgets. So he's he's getting a kitty together. Now, you can imagine if they were in opposition, they'd be screaming blue murder about this. And it's it's really not acceptable that the government of the day, whoever they are, say, well, we're the incumbents, bad luck. We're going to describe um, spending of public funds using our own party livery. We're going to claim these things. So 
Um, to get back to your point, Labor have committed to these things and I've, I've heard a speech by Mark Dreyfus at the Press Club last year that was um, very powerful on these on these issues and recognising the risk of corruption. So they have and maybe it's just that people don't know about it very well. The crossbenchers were the ones that forced, uh, Cathy McGowan in particular, were the ones that forced the government uh, before the last election to commit, uh, sorry, in 2018 when they held the balance of power, to commit to a National Integrity Commission and they've really stalled on it since then uh, with no sign of um, the bill being brought forward for debate. Um, so they're probably hoping that they can get away without doing it before the next election or they'll bring the bill in and it'll go off to committee somewhere for some sort of debate. Um, the crossbenchers are really putting the blowtorch on government over this, but they don't have the numbers. So you will hear constant statements from Zali Stegall, from Rex Patrick, from Helen Haynes and others about these sort of issues. And Andrew Wilkie's been a long-time supporter of integrity issues, including whistleblowing protection, whistleblower protections. So, you know, it, it, the numbers count is really what the answer is here and uh, the Greens had a bill in for years and years around a National Integrity Commission. And if you don't have those people in government or, or you don't have them holding the balance of power, you won't achieve these things. You'll get more of the same is the simple answer. I'll, I'll put the question to you as well, Lindy. So certainly um, pick up Fiona's point there that, that Labor has announced some changes, but certainly, um, you know, I think the Greens and independents have been much stronger at, at pushing for reforms in a whole set of areas um, here. Um, why do you think it is, Lindy, that the, the major parties have largely vacated this space? Okay, so, I mean, I think it is, it, it is important to point out that I think Labor does actually have a really different position on this stuff to the Coalition and did take um, a bunch of reforms to the last election. But I, nonetheless, I think there is also some real reservations um, and one of the things that I was struck by on the line of questioning last time I went to a Senate committee on this, and I've been to several, um, it's, you know, they roll up and ask the same questions year in, year out, and we all know what the answers are and nobody's going to do anything about them. Um, and that was on in the political donation space. And one of the things that became clear was that Labor is actually quite concerned about um, about which is a new concern, it seems to me, at least it's a changed line of questioning, is that I think because we're seeing a much more aggressive approach to rewarding friends and punishing enemies in terms of the delivery of government contracts and things, we're seeing Labor is actually getting cold feet on a whole bunch of transparency measures because they fear that their donations will dry up if people are disclosed as donating to them because those people will then be starved of government contracts. Um, so I think that's part of why, well, you know, that, that seemed to me part of why Labor was more lukewarm than I think they've been previously. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out, you know, I'd sort of like to draw it back a, a little bit and kind of talk about the significance of what's happening at the moment as a historical moment, as a political, as a shift in the political culture, um, because the political culture is, you know, we can have laws and institutions, but actually how they function in practice hugely comes down to the political culture and how politicians understand what the rules of the game are, what they believe they're supposed to be trying to achieve, how they think the system works. And we're actually seeing a really significant shift in the political culture at the moment. And part of what that's about is that, you know, the big sort of animating force in politics in the English-speaking world at the moment um, is, you know, it's sort of described in terms of the rise of right-wing populism, but really it's about this sort of, it's about a group of conservatives who've been motivated to go into politics because they oppose the race and gender equality movements. And that, that we've seen, you know, that this movement happened first in the US, a very active effort to kind of try and stack and take over the Republican Party. And then we saw those, those activities get copied and repeated here. And the thing that's really significant about this as a group is that they are a group that look back at the last 50 years and the practice of politics 
of this idea of, you know, reason debate between competing interests and compromise on the centre as having delivered incremental gains to the race and gender equality movements. And their view is that basically politics as usual has them losing. And so this idea that many of us who are involved in public policy where we're like, oh, democracy and politics should be about people with competing interests and perspectives sitting down and nutting out a compromise that people can live with. That's not how this new movement are seeing politics. Um, and they're also, it's really important to know that they're not there to build stuff, they're there to stop stuff. So they're not necessarily that, you know, they're not focused on that, how you bring people together around the table. And they're not looking to create, you know, they're not necessarily supporting institutions of representation and compromise. Um, and what we're seeing is this shift towards this real patronage politics, which is what I need to do is I want I want to replace people from your tribe with people from my tribe. And politics and democratic politics is about building a network of patronage where people who join our team will get rewards, people who are not on our team will be punished, and we've just got to collect enough people together to get ourselves to 50% plus one, and then we call the shots. And so it's a really different idea of what democratic politics is, um, and it's really and even though I think, you know, this actual group that is reasonably small, its impact on the political culture has been huge. Um, and we, we need to be really mindful that what we're watching is a real revolution, a real transformation in our democratic politics, and we shouldn't be really worried about it. Um, I completely agree. If I can jump in on that um, with what Lindy's saying, this model of um, democracy is deliberate and it's being reproduced across the democratic um, nations of the world. We look at Trump's America and uh, Trump was able to tap in to the disaffection and unhappiness of millions of people and then to garner their loyalty by a series of constant lies. He lied so often to them, daily, daily lies. They were obvious lies that the press could have kept up with. There were things like, I'm a stable genius or I know all about windmills or I know all about the engineering of the wall and I know what it costs. And it, they were so blatant and so obvious. And some really big lies were told along the way about infectmectin and how you treat COVID and it's not really real. And, and so the sprinkle of lies does something to us in our psychology. I think we, we become... Um, so overwhelmed by the barrage of lies that come at us that we don't know how to deal with them or we just go into this strange accept everything he says no matter how bizarre it is. And, you know, th th there has been times in history, including some really awful times in our history, where those have been the deliberate methods of government to lie to the population, to lie so big and so often that the population just believe whatever they're told. So um, this strategy, this populist nationalist strategy that's being pursued over the world that's built on misrepresentation and fear is a deliberate political strategy to keep people in power. And I guess in terms of what we can do about it, well, we can become aware of it and to be intelligent enough to weigh up when we made promises during an election, is this my money, my, my, my global money that's being spent to purchase my vote? Am I being sold a story of fear? Or can I look beyond that to look at what the parties are actually offering me? All right, why don't we move to some audience questions now? And as anticipated, they are flooding in. Um, lots of people um, wondering, you know, specifics about what we can do about this. Um, I'll, I'll put one to you, Lindy, from John Knox. Um, he's specifically interested in climate change and the influence of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, he says, how do we counter the very big dollars that are preventing action on climate? So a few things. Um, one thing is never underestimate how powerful phone calls to MPs are around, you know, around a bunch of these issues. I think it's, it's a Tony Windsor who said politics is... Um, 
politics is the decisions get made by those that show up, that most, that actually quite a small people range of people, quite a small group of people are actually engaged and active and you can actually get in and have a say and it, and MPs are human. If there are a lot of phone calls around around corruption and scandal issues, if people are getting phone calls about that stuff, that stuff does matter. So that would be my first thing. I mean, our second thing has got to be, I actually think that Craig Kelly and Clive Palmer might have just provided the greatest incentive the two major parties have yet had to introduce political donations caps that I think that Craig Kelly and Clive Palmer risk doing enormous damage to both the major parties in the next election and that, you know, it really exposes the problem of us not having any caps or maximum amounts that the fossil fuel industry in particular can give, but that anybody can give. Um, so I would think that this might be an opportunity um, for anybody involved in any sort of activism to, to get in touch with and to be putting the pressure on to say we need laws that stop Clive Palmer from being able to distort and steal this, elect this next election. Um, that it shouldn't, one billionaire should not be able to determine election outcomes to the extent to which um, he will he will have a very big influence. Um, and I think the third thing is I think that one of the big questions over the next few years is going to be how this reactionary moment plays out. You know, as I say, we've got this reactionary politics that's happened. The Australian context is really different to the US. Um, I think the US, the US problem is long running and deep and it speaks to a, a very big fissure in their politics that's been there for, for 100 years. I think the marriage plebiscite demonstrated that that's not the case in Australia, that actually those those committed right-wing conservatives were prepared to hold the Liberal Party to ransom over the marriage plebiscite and most Australians didn't agree and didn't think it was that higher a priority. So I don't think we've got that same, you know, we haven't quite got, we haven't got that same, um, these issues don't have quite, it doesn't act. The context is not the same. It's not clear that these groups had the same level of support here. And so one of the things that will be interesting will be to see whether, in fact, this ends up shaking apart and busting the coalition apart. On the one hand, one could imagine a world going into the next election where you've got um, Craig Kelly pulling off the anti-vaxxers to the right and you've got this big movement now of moderate independents and moderate liberals who, um, who are really uncomfortable with what's going on, who are pulling in an opposite direction and whether or not that actually could hobble the coalition and we'll see a big realignment is possible. Um, of course, the alternative to that is that Morrison will see how hard it is to hold this house of cards together and will actually go very, very hard on racism and anti-China threat to try and drive a kind of nationalist race-based threat to try and hold things together through that. So I think we kind of, you know, our politics, the next few years is going to be incredibly important in terms of whether or not, um, whether or not we do get this big shakeout where I think we'll see the whole right-wing side of politics being thrown up in the air and reorganised, or whether, in fact, we might actually go through, enter into a really nasty period of a very corrupt, very authoritarian, centred around quite, a, quite an aggressive um, race-based, probably China-based kind of, kind of negative politics. Um, and I would suggest that anybody with some activist energy might want to get in there and help try and shape how that, um, how you know, how those things, how those forces play out over the next few years is going to be really profound. And the difference is that, you know, the old um, what's the old adage? Never underestimate the ability of a small group of concerned citizens to change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. I'm, I'm glad you finished that on a, on a more positive note. It's really interesting there for a minute. Um, Fiona, if I can put one of the questions to you, this one's from Ralph Katz. Um, you touched on public funding of elections as, as a way of minimising corruption. Um, would this limit the entrance of new parties or independents into parliament? 
Um, well, if the funding followed the current model, which is that you receive public funding depending on how many votes you received in the last election, then yes, there would be necessarily an impact on small parties, micro parties. But there's a way to do it that doesn't depend on your pre-existing vote. You know, parties could be allocated funding that they had to provide receipts for. Remember when One Nation, uh, before the rules were changed at one point, One Nation received um, a slab of funding but hadn't actually spent the money. So now at least the parties have to produce receipts for what it is that they're declaring, uh, that they're claiming rather. Um, so I, I think that is a concern and you would need to manage the way that the funds were distributed, public funds were distributed to make sure you couldn't exclude micro parties because that's one of the strengths of our democracies that people can vote for micro parties if they wish to. Um, you know, we've seen some unfortunate consequences with the um, preference sharing deals where um, some might say, hooray, but others might say, you know, how can that be that you elect senators who have such a micro vote? But, you know, that's the way our Senate is designed and we have to realise that it's not a democracy, one person, one vote in the Senate. We have, we have states who have the number of senators far beyond their population. We have parties who, um, ha who can benefit from the way the preferences are distributed down the line that have members there um, which don't reflect their popular vote at all. So in a sense, our, our democracy is already undermined because of the way our constitutional arrangements are in place. And they just as they don't reflect um, people who might be able to vote but can't because they haven't registered to vote. So um, there are some systems already that skew skew away from one person, one vote. But, yes, getting back to campaign funding, I think in um, respect of that question, there would need to be care in the design of it. But um, at the very least, we need caps and disclosure, real-time disclosure of campaign funding so that people can be aware of who's, who's seeking to buy influence. And that happens in some of the states at the moment, like Queensland. There's no reason that couldn't happen on a federal level. Yeah, I did. I did love um, one of the reasons. Apparently, it was it was uh, too much administrative burden was the reason they couldn't do it at the federal level, which which is pretty hard to swallow when you see a lot of the smaller states have, have managed to do it pretty effectively. And, and most of the parties are currently putting in nil returns, which means they're saying everything we raised is spent during the campaign, which means that there's no visibility at all of, of what that spending is, is going on. Um, so individuals have to disclose when they're making uh, campaign contributions above the cap, which is something around $13,000, $14,000 at the moment. But, um, you know, you could make multiple contributions of $10,000 from different entities if you've got a web of companies behind you and no one would be any the wiser. In, mm -hmm. in Queensland, they were filtering payments to the state um, government uh, entities, the, the Liberal Party or LNP in, in um, Queensland, and then compounding those and sending them on to the federal um, the party so that there was apparently an, a, a deliberate avoidance of the um, disclosure rules up there. So the, all of that has to be tightened because this is, this is a real area of risk of corruption uh, and a way in which people seek to assert influence over the agenda. Yeah. Um, Lindy, I want to put a question to you about the role of the public service in, in this. This is from Philip Laird. Uh, he says, do you think the downsizing of the public sector going back to the 90s, including engineers in road and rail agencies, and with more and more functions outsourced to consultants, um, leads to a situation where the government is not always an informed buyer? And has that increased the scope for corruption? Yeah, look, I think it's a it's a hugely important um, shift and it's really problematic that the combination of downsizing and de-skilling of the public service um, in terms of people not having a depth of, of expertise means that decision-making is being increasingly reliant on the sectors that are regulated themselves to be providing information that instead of the public service trying to put forward, um, putting forward policy proposals that are, that are uh, 
that are representing a broader set of interests, what we've got increasingly is government going directly to the industries themselves or to consultants um, to produce reports about how they'd like themselves to be regulated. Um, and that reliance, the fact that they don't they don't have any context or expertise for assessing what they're being told makes them very, very vulnerable. With the best will in the world, they're incredibly vulnerable um, to being captured by, by being so reliant on industry for information. Um, a question from uh, Ian Marshman, fantastic grant and board member, um, and, and this could be for either of you. Uh, he says it's very depressing for everyday citizens is this a perpetual slippery slope or are there examples from other countries where the trend has been arrested, if not reversed? Uh, and if so, what can we learn from them? Um, Lindy, did you come across any good um, positive examples in, in your work? Look, I absolutely can. I mean, in the sense that, um, to be honest, the places that have the strongest anti-corruption regimes um, are the places that have had the worst corruption scandals. Um, so there does tend to be a move where, you know, things, if you like, erode to a point um, and then you get crises and then you get uh, good regimes put in place. Um, so hopefully we're part of that cycle at the moment um, and uh, that there is that that what you need is that, that, that we do historically see those pendulum swings um, where in response to big scandals you get better regimes. Um, um, Emma, uh, Emma Clark, sorry, is asking a similar question, Fiona, so I'll put, it, I'll, yeah, sure. I'll put the same one to you, but she's also asking if there's also um, good state examples, so if, if you've got any of those as well. Um, well, we can certainly cherry pick from um, around across Australia different state examples, for example, with the um, disclosure of campaign funding, but we can also cherry pick from around the world. And Lindy's absolutely right, some of the strongest anti-corruption um, commissions and regimes have been in countries that have really struggled with this and there's been political will to establish these commissions and they work very effectively and they're well resourced. Some of the um, examples that we can cherry pick uh, come in an initiative known as Open Government, which is a global initiative that Australia has actually signed on to. We're up to our third national action plan, I think, and I chaired that Open Government or co-chaired it with um, um, some for senior public servants for a number of years. And they include initiatives such as open contracting, open budgeting, so that the public can actually have a say about how we spend a certain percentage of public funds. Open budgets where there's a record and disclosure of what government's spending on beyond uh, the posting that currently happens at the moment. So you can interrogate what it is, uh, the processes behind the decision to spend money. These things and an embrace of openness are things that our government could be doing very easily and, in fact, have publicly committed to. So um, when they uh, encourage public input into those processes, that's the time at which we could all be flooding them with submissions and saying, try this, try this, try this. And I think Australia has an opportunity really to be at the forefront of this. We've got some great thinkers here, some great academics, retired judges and others who are thinking about integrity issues in a very in-depth way. So the Accountability Roundtable, for example, is producing a, a, a tome on the rule of law and how we uh, have been undermining it, what we need to do to address it. There's some great thinkers out here, including the Grattan Institute and others who are focusing on the issue and really, if the government was serious about this, they could set up a, a round table of sorts to, to delve into these different areas. What do we need to do to get whistleblowing really right so that former um, public servants who haven't been covered by whistleblower protections are covered because they should be, so that journalists aren't pursued um, by law enforcement agencies for publishing things we all need to know. There's a whole realm of stuff we should be doing. And, uh, yes, in short, there are plenty of examples from overseas that we could easily tap into. Fantastic. 
Um, sorry, my questions are moving around. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say this. I've just been summoned back to court at five oh. to one. So if that's okay with everybody, um, excuse Absolutely. me for leaving early, but I do need to talk. We to will um, make sure we get as many questions in before you leave, Fiona. But then we'll, we'll maybe um, I should have shorter them. answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put a question from Lynette Smith, which I think is a, a really interesting one. I'll, I'll start with you, Lindy. Um, she says, you know, we, we've said that culture is really at the heart of the the problem. But rules have limited power to change culture. How do how do we actually go about shifting the mindset and the culture within Parliament? Um, look, I kind of think that I do. Actually, I think that the push for the for independence um, is actually the biggest likely driver of change at the moment. I think the other things that drive change, to be honest, is the major parties are now small organisations and they're reasonably easily stacked. You know, the, what we've been seeing at the moment is a product of a really deliberate effort to stack the Liberal Party. And um, and one thing to do would be if everybody who would like to see the culture of the Liberal Party change were to go out and join it, that might, that might be quite helpful. So engaging with... So, Two sets of things. One is to actually engage with the major parties. Um, it's because they've got so small um, that they have become more vulnerable to capture. Um, the second thing is, I do think that the you know there is this you know this move now towards um, towards independence. I think lots of seats that are perhaps naturally liberal moderate seats. Um, where you're getting independence running, um, and I think that that movement might end up being quite important. And certainly, certainly, if we're looking at the makeup of the crossbench is enormously important. Um, in my research, um, when I was looking at the impact of corporate power, the impact of the independence and the crossbench um, was enormous, and the extent to which people in those are not subject to the constraints and the structures that do bind the major parties. Um, so I would think that, that that actually that's going to be the next driver of, of change in the patterns of how, of how Parliament works. Um, and I, can I just um, jump in on that? The, the federal government has shown itself incapable of tackling corruption, and just as it has, in the words of former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, shown itself incapable of tackling climate change. Um, and yes, the independents can certainly bring um, the pressure to bear in, in relation to discrete issues, but ultimately they don't have the power to bring leg the legislative agenda onto the floor of Parliament to be voted on. So my short answer would be if you want to tackle corruption, you've got to change the government. All right, Fiona, I'm very conscious that you need to go in a minute, so I'm going to um, squeeze in one last question to you and then feel free to <laughs> head off. Uh, sure, thank off. you. Um, if, if I was um, to play accountability fairy and I was to give you one wish, um, one single change that you could make to the accountability framework to try and improve decision-making in the public interest, uh, what would you choose? Well, accountability is fundamentally an exercise of public trust. So my one wish is that those who seek public office and those who attain public office would commit themselves to, to conduct themselves with integrity and in the public interest because ultimately that's the only thing that's going to make a difference if that commitment is made and then there's a holding to account for that commitment and responsibility taken. And I think if people were prepared to speak out when they make mistakes rather than give a spin and obfuscation, if they were prepared to admit their um, failures, then we could forgive them or not. We could forgive them or vote them out. And I think giving us the power to do that with, a, you know, the full range of information is really what we're needing here. Fantastic answer. Thank you very much for joining us, Fiona. Yeah, thank um, you. Lindy, I'm going to give you one wish as well. Uh, pardon me, Lindy, if I duck out here and thanks, everybody. Um, 
one wish, my wish would be proportional voting in the lower house, <laughs> um, which is a fairly big one. Just but, to throw a banner in the works there. <laughs> just to throw it. Um, but, so around the world we know that two-party systems are more vulnerable to corruption to, than multi-party systems elected by proportional representation. Um, and we have a really significant difficulty that, um, I mean, we have a significant difficulty of the stickiness of our constitution and our institutions that these systems that were put in place 100 years ago aren't necessarily keeping up and they're very hard to change. Um, so that and I think, yeah, um, but I think key thing right now, the immediate go-to thing is um, is s s donations caps and spending caps um, to limit, you know, and I think that um, that Clive Palmer should be a rallying point of suggesting that maybe that one individual shouldn't have quite the level of influence over our democratic system that they do. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Well, uh, thank you, Lindy, and thank you to Fiona in absentia um, for, you know, what I, I found a really fascinating um, conversation. So I really um, appreciate you joining us and, and sharing your insights and, and passion. Um, for the audience, uh, thank you too. I'm, I'm really pleased to say that you will uh, hear a lot more from Grattan on these types of topics in the next six months. Um, we're planning on doing a series of research reports on uh, what we're calling spoils of power, misuse of office for, for private and political gain, um, touching on a lot of the issues that we explore today. So things like politicisation of grants, public appointments, um, using government advertising for political ends. Um, and the reason we're doing it is ultimately at Grattan, we, we care about better public policy. Um, and, and to get better policy, we need better political institutions. And that includes getting the accountability infrastructure right um, so if you like the sound of, of more independent and high quality research and advocacy on these issues, uh, please do consider supporting Grattan. Uh, it's only with your support that we're going to be able to deliver this work uh, and particularly deliver it before the next election, which I think is really a critical window for convincing parties to adopt these types of reforms. Um, thank you again. Um, stay safe and have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Take care.